Good morning, church. Good morning. And welcome to the first Sunday of the new year, January 3rd. If you can please rise with me for our opening prayer. God, give us wisdom for your truths. Fill me with a desire to faithfully follow after you more than anything else. Thank you that you are far greater than whatever we may face in the day. Thank you that your presence goes with me and that your joy is never dependent on circumstances, but it may be true and lasting and give us strength. We ask for your peace to lead us from your grace and goodness to cover our lives this day. Let your spirit and power breathe in us and through us, again, refreshing us with new. In Jesus, our newborn Savior, amen. I would like to welcome Linda Miller as this week's musician, and also Morris Powell as this week's liturgist. Our first hymn will be hymn number 145, Morning Has Broken. So now you know it's coming. Do me a favor, look at your friend, look at your neighbor, look at your loved one, look at your beloved pet, 
and say to them, I am glad, I am glad that you are here. That you are here. Now look at someone else in your family. Look at your children. Look at your mother-in-law. Look at your wife or your brother or your sister. Let them know that God loves you. God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about that. And there's nothing you can do about it. A bit of a curve here on our second Sunday after Christmas. We've been in a tandem with Isaiah in the Gospel text. So why are we shifting to Ephesians? Because we need the blessing and we need to be blessed. Since there was a change coming anyway, why not make a change and listen in on Paul's opening words to church in Ephesus. Wrapping up Christmas this week, some may have already packed away everything. Others may still be sitting in the glow of lights and tinsel. But the goal is to shuffle it all away, but rather to embrace the fullness of community that we have become, incorporating the new but becoming one in Christ. It is not, however, about self-congratulations that we gather. Yes, indeed, we are blessed, but we are blessed in order to bless the source of the blessing. Paul tells us that the gift we received, the gift of new life, is so that we might live for the praise of God and God's glory. That's what this worship experience is all about. It's about praising God. Yes, of course, every worship service includes praise, but this week's praise is the beginning and the end. And in the heart is the call to praise, to a life of praise. This is what living the celebration means, living a life of praise, but now our circle is wider because of the company we have come and the company that may have stayed. Maybe that company includes neighbors and new potential members, but certainly the company is the renewed spirit of Christ who dwells among us in new and dynamic ways. That is why we need to be careful and not speak of a return to normalcy. We aren't returning to anything. We are going forward. We are embracing the new thing that God is doing in our midst. We embrace this new community that we have become. Even if it is the same people, we are renewed and revived by our attention to the Advent and Christmas season that just passed. For those of you who long for the past, when times were before COVID-19, I ask you not to think about that. Think about looking forward, looking ahead at this new way we need to live. Until there's a time when we're not wearing masks, when we're not always social distancing, when a hug can be a hug and a handshake a handshake. Amen. For those of you who have your smartphones who ask you to take them out, take a picture of you watching church or here at church, and post it on Facebook or Twitter. I've been enjoying seeing some of the postings from some of you who have been posting as you watch on your big screens church service. Now, if you are able, please stand with me for our call to worship. God calls us into a future that we cannot see. We come wondering where God is calling us now. God calls us to believe in a future of justice and peace, of generosity and compassion. We come wanting to give our hearts to that future. God calls us to commit our lives love and service. Let us worship the God who calls us into the unknown. Now is the time of the passing of our peace. We place our hand over our hearts. We wave to one another. We give the peace sign. 
acknowledging the love that we have for each other and for Christ. Our response hymn this morning will be hymn number 347, The Spirit Song. When you're praying to God, 
Do you really know who you are praying to? Are you even sure that someone is there listening? Do you find that you are doing all the talking and when you stop there is only silence? A silence that does not reassure you that someone has actually heard your prayer. Wouldn't it be nice if God would just say, okay, I hear you, keep talking. We understand that prayer is something that is powered by faith and done with the belief that the one we pray to hears, even if there is silence after we finish expressing our words of praise, our words of thanksgiving, and our various requests. Even so, many who claim to be believers have a hard time imagining the one they are offering their prayers to. We know, however, that children don't have this problem when they pray because their faith is so simple and so straightforward, it leaves no room for doubt. I would imagine that this is one of the reasons why Jesus said that our faith should be like that of children, uncluttered by adult hesitation and doubt that God is there to hear our answer to our prayers. Children tend to approach God as Father and see Him as good, so they are content to speak to Him in a simple and confident manner. It is sad that as we grow older and influenced by large, a largely unbelieving world, our view of God changes and we begin to have false ideas about Him. Unfortunately, these false ideas interfere with our prayer life. This five-part series, therefore, is an attempt to improve our understanding of who God really is so that we better know the one that we are praying to and what he deserves from us. Jesus teaches us the experience of internal life is the ongoing process of knowing God more completely. And we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to begin gaining this knowledge. We can start right now. Also, we can get to know God even better. We will have a greater confidence in facing death and dealing with all the difficulties that accompany it. The more I know my God, the less I am afraid of leaving this world in order to be with Him. Paul the Apostle writes with this type of confidence because he was a man who knew God intimately. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul was a person who was confident in God, a man who truly knew God, and thus could write these encouraging words to those who feared death because their knowledge of God was limited. Intimate knowledge of God produces confidence, and this is an assurance that's promoted and an effective way of prayer life. What does James say concerning those who are confident in prayer? The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. James 5, 15. A strong faith is required for strong results. The way to build faith, therefore, is to get to know the God of the Bible more perfectly. The prayer in faith is the prayer offered with the belief that God is there, hears, and is able to answer now as he has in the past. As already mentioned, the faith comes as we grow in our knowledge of the one that we pray to. Is God a he or a she? Let us begin this effort by knowing God by answering one of the most popular questions about him. Is God a he, a she, or an it? This question is usually asked by individuals who are not familiar with the Bible. Recently, there have been efforts to eliminate all gender references to God in Scripture. 
This was a reaction to the nature of the Bible and male-dominated imagery it contained. Some feminist groups suggested that we should refer to God as a she in order to readdress the imbalance of the last 2,000 years. For this reason, some modern editions of the Bible do not refer to God as a he. At times they refer to him as she or use the term Mother God or Father God in an effort to blend together a homogeneous God. Of course, this politically correct thinking and posturing does not take into account the references to God in the Bible. They're metaphors. For example, the Bible refers to Peter as a he because Peter was a man. No metaphor required here. But when the Bible refers to God as he, he's using a metaphor. Whether you use male or female references does make no difference. They are still metaphors that only describe through imagery part of God's character. The simple truth is that God is neither male nor female. God is pure spirit and is thus not human, let alone male or female. Jesus himself says that God is spirit in John 4, 24. And therein lies the problem of knowing God. If he were human, male or female, we could more easily relate to him. But because his nature is completely different from ours, we have difficulty in knowing and understanding him. The Greeks had their group of gods who were part human and part supernatural. These gods, however, had very human characteristics. They wept, they were jealous, they married, and they cheated on their spouses. The God of the Bible, however, is not human, so we should not attribute to him weak and sinful human characteristics. He is not like us. We may be like him in many ways, but he is not like us. For this reason, God himself reveals himself to us using terms and imageries that are taken from a frame of reference, not his. For example, he would not help us to know God more deeply if he simply said that he is like the angels. Angels are spirit beings also, and we cannot relate or know them any more than we know God. Since their nature is so different than ours, consequently, using them and only them as a reference would not be very helpful to us. What God does, therefore, is select people and things that belong in our world in order to describe what exists in another world or dimension. One of the dangers in attempting to know God from the things that he has created, however, is a human tendency to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. For they exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1.25 the Apostle Paul warns against making a God out of things. They represent or give us an insight into God's nature. Oddly enough, in today's society, we are doing the reverse. We are trying to eliminate or replace the images that the Bible uses to describe God. And are trying to replace them with symbols that suit us better and fulfill our political or our humanistic agendas. In other words, we are not using the words, the images, and the metaphors that the inspired writers have given us to describe God, but are replacing them with our own symbols and metaphors to describe God in ways that will fit current thinking. The answer to this kind of tinkering with the Bible text is to realize that God, who not only chose to reveal himself to man, but also the manner in which he would do so, should be the final arbitrator of how he is described and perceived by those he has created. The first lines of the book of Hebrews addresses the very issue in a proper context. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, 
in the prophets and in the many portions and in many ways. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Notice carefully that the Hebrew writer is saying about God revealing himself. God spoke or revealed the various ones, the patriarchs and the prophets, in the many portions and in many ways. In other words, God made himself known in a variety of ways to Moses in the burning bush, to Isaiah by a vision. He inspired others with images to the Israelites with the use of fire, thunder, lightning on a mountain. He revealed himself to different individuals and peoples in the way, manner, and portion that is suitable for the time and effective for the idea that he wanted to convey to them. For example, when God revealed himself to Moses, he appeared as a burning bush that was not extinguished. In order to show Moses that he was dealing with the internal one, this was important for two reasons. First, Moses needed to understand that the one who appeared to him was the same God who had made promises to his ancestors hundreds of years before. Secondly, God could send Moses to a, a face a powerful king to demand the release of his people. And Moses needed to have confidence that the one who sent him was more powerful than the one he was going to be sent to. Both of these requirements were fulfilled with his appearance at the fiery bush, and nothing could extinguish that bush. If God had more early spoken to him in a dream, Moses could have doubted that the dream was real and contained a specific instruction. A burning bush did not burn out. Seeing its flame, feeling its heat, and hearing a voice from its broad daylight, this was a way that he could not dismiss. For this reason, God chose ways to reveal himself to various people in order to convey specific messages. This is why the writer of Hebrews says that God spoke in many ways and in many portions and then goes on to say, in these last days he spoke to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. God, not as a man, not as a woman, but as an it. From the beginning, God has used a variety of inanimate objects to demonstrate facets of his character. For example, in Exodus 3, 2, he appeared as a burning bush that was not destroyed. Why this way to reveal himself, as I explained previously, to demonstrate his eternal and powerful nature to Moses. Later on, God would eventually send Moses to do great miracles. So he begins by demonstrating his own power in the burning bush. The point for Moses to grasp is that if God could appear as a burning bush, he could also divide the Red Sea or provide water from a rock. The burning bush was a preview of all things that God would eventually do through Moses as he led the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery to the performance of incredible miracles. The Jews referred to God as Father and Lord, or Father and King, but it was Jesus who developed the idea of God as Father. In the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to God simply as Father or Parent over a hundred times. Paul the Apostle repeats this beautiful and comforting imagery in Romans 8, 15 through 17, where, the, where he refers to God as Abba, or Daddy, which was more an intimate term. For as though the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, the disobedience of the one, the many were made righteous. The first man, Adam, fell, and then one like Adam, Jesus, was resurrected. He will be the one who raises us up, who fall because of Adam's sin. 
More importantly, the full nature of God is represented in human form because humans are made in the image and the likeness of God. Animals are not and objects are not. So we come back to the original question. Who are we praying to? We are praying to someone who is not human but can relate to human need and emotion because he took on a human nature and experienced life as we know it. He then returned to the spiritual dimension and position from henceforth where he came. This is who God is. You see him in Jesus because as humans, this is the clearest view of what we have of him. Therefore, what does this mean? To begin with, it means that God can relate to us. He can feel what we feel and thus understand all of our concerns, our joys, and our fears. We are therefore not wasting our time in prayer. Nevertheless, it remains difficult for us to relate to Him. He is so much more than we are, and because of this, we cannot take all of Him in. Interesting enough, He can he can even relate to the feeling on our part because appearing on earth in the body of a man, Jesus Christ experienced the limiting nature of human life and death. Therefore, everything from birth to death that we raise up to him in prayer, he can relate to because he also was born and ultimately died. For this reason, he understands every experience between the two points in anyone's life. Secondly, it means that God does care his intimate involvement with mankind throughout history. Even to the point of becoming human himself for a time demonstrates that he does care and does hear our prayers. Why would, why would he, after his divine nature, to experience human living if he didn't care? This drastic, painful, and humbling act on his part teaches us that we have a sympathetic and eager recipient of our prayers. Finally, it means that God wants to help. The Bible shows how zealous God is for his people, how eager he is for sinners to come back to him, and how ready he is to punish those who harm his children. With God, we have hope that our prayers will be answered, not grudgingly so. When we confess our faith to God, to others, therefore, let us remember to describe Him as the Bible does, using the words, images, and metaphors that He Himself has provided in His Word, so that we can know and describe as accurately as possible the one we believe, the one we serve, the one we love, and offer our prayers to Him. Amen.
announcements for the good of our church. You can always get a copy of our weekly bulletin by going to our website, www.castcity.org, and click on bulletins and newsletters. If you missed any of our Advent devotionals or our Christmas Eve service, they are always posted on our Facebook pages or through our website. We are moving our new member class until April 2021 because no one signed up due to this COVID-19. So if you are interested in becoming a member of Cass City United Methodist Church, please let the church office know or this pastor know so we can sign you up for those classes. Cleaning the church continues weekly, and we thank Pam and Morris Powell for buffing and cleaning the floors. Also want to thank Morris for repainting and fixing the eastern wall. Our Feed the Hungry program continues to collect non-perishable food, and our first formal meeting will be on Saturday, January 30th at 10 a.m. If you wish to participate, come to this first meeting here at the church. These are just a few announcements I have for the good of the church. We will begin with a moment of holy silence to allow for centering, settling, and focusing on silent prayer for them and life's challenges that we all face. Will you pray with me? God of abundance and mercy, we give joyfully. We thank you for your eternal love and your healing presence in the celebration of bread and the cup. Bless this body of Christ that we may attend to our call to be your servants with each other and throughout the world. Amen. Our prayers continue for Chuck and Michelle Earl and their family as their family has set up a GoFundMe page. So if you can go to GoFundMe.com and search for Chuck and Michelle Earl's medical fund. And if you can, please make a donation to help this family. Ask for your prayers for Janice Seely, who fell and has hurt her leg and has, when you hear this message, has already received her surgery. Pray that everything is okay. So any notes or cards you wish to send to Janice, please do so. I ask for your prayers for Dora and Steve Fobear as Dora continues to recover from COVID-19. Continue prayers for Diane Arnold and Ruth Ann and Gary Reichert and Kirk Kaufman in San Diego, California. Linda and Roger Miller and Kathy and Roy Tucky and Jane and Keith Mitchell. Lois and Jack Gallagher, Barb and Bob Wood, Archie and Chris Allen, Dick and Judy Wallace. Ask for your prayers for Ivor Rockwell and Naomi Wallace, Dick Wallace's mom, as they have recovered from COVID-19. Prayers for Phil and Kathy Nichols, and Maury and Buddy. I ask for your continued prayers for Dolly Bench and Ed and Judy Prophet, Jack and Pam Burns, Bill and Shirley Zinniger, Charles and Iris Tucky, Sandy David, Pastor Barry David, Pastor Fred Bowden and his mom, Lorraine Bowden. Daly and Linda Parrish, Dale and Nancy Hutchinson. Prayers for our congregation, including our shut-ins. God, thank you for helping us to make it through this difficult year. Thank you that you've carried us through with the uncertainty of deep waters, through the flames of trials, and through the pain and of, a, of our losses, we are constantly aware of how much we need you, your grace, your strength, your power, working through us during these darkest days. Amen. Now is the time of offering and tithes. 
We ask you to continue your weekly, monthly, and quarterly giving. And if possible, to come back to church each Sunday. Holy God and parent of us all, we have moved through the season of, of family and Christmas joy, and we are reminded that beyond our earthly families, you have adopted us into your redeemed family. Through the saving, redeeming work, we have become heirs, and our redemption is the magnificent gift of salvation. We give our gifts, we give ourselves as only fitting the response of your adoption of us, your rebellious children. Lead us in a way that this year, in Jesus' name, we will have the strength to live through this COVID-19.